Welcome to The Feminist Romantic. I'm Kara McKinnon, and on this episode, I'll be talking about romance series. So this is the fifth episode of The Feminist Romantic, but it was supposed to be the fourth episode of The Feminist Romantic. And oddly enough, the episode is now airing of only a few days before my sister-in-law's wedding, which is a day before my wedding anniversary. Uh, it's been 11 years since my husband and I got married, but we've been together for almost 14. So I'm really thinking about long-term relationships. So it it actually makes sense that I would be talking about romance series today, even though half of what I'll be talking about today are series that only discuss one couple at a time, and then once they get to their happy ever after, you move on to the next couple. But the other half of the episode is going to be about what I'm calling non-traditional romance series. And these are series that follow the same love story over the course of several books. On the standard side, I have three different series that I'm going to be looking at more closely. One is a historical romance series by Elizabeth Hoyt. It's called the Maiden Lane series. And unlike other historical series, it is not set in the Regency era. Not that all historical romances are set during the Regency, but a very large percentage of them are, thanks to Georgette Heyer. These books are set in the Georgian period, which preceded the Regency, which is something that sets them apart a little bit. And I'll be talking in the feature of this episode about what else sets them apart from other romance series. In addition to that, I'll be discussing a contemporary romance series by Lisa Kleypas called The Travis's Series, and a paranormal series by Jennifer Ashley called The Shifters Unbound Series. Amusingly, both Lisa Kleypas and Jennifer Ashley are also known for their historical romance series, but I found these two uh, of their series to be a little more representative of a type of series that I want to talk about. For the non-traditional series, which would be any series that follows either a single couple or um, a larger group, which I'll talk about in a second, Um, over the course of several books, I've had to go into what I call genre mashup territory. And you'll see why when I describe which series I'm going to talk about. One of them is J.D. Robb's In Death series, J.D. Robb being the pseudonym of Nora Roberts, who has written literally hundreds of romances and sold millions and millions of copies and is one of the most well-known romance authors in existence today. But the In Death series is a mashup between mystery, romance, and sci-fi. So the second series I'll be talking about is the Wyborn and Griffin series by Jordan L. Hawk. This is a paranormal, gay, historical mystery romance series. Lots of stuff being mashed up in there. I'll also talk a little bit about some series that you wouldn't necessarily think of as romance right away, but that have either strong ties to or very clear romantic elements in them. And the first of those is the Outlander series by Diana Gabaldon, and the other is the Stephanie Plum series by Janet Ivanovich. So those are the series I'll be talking about. I'll throw out a couple other examples as well, but I'll specifically be focusing on those. And what I want to interrogate in this episode is how the storytelling requirements are different for a linked series, which is like the traditional method, versus a single story series, as well as what that means for the romances being portrayed and how they have to shift in the way that they're presented. A note on terminology before I really get started. I mentioned uh, a few seconds ago that there are, of course, stories with more than a single couple. And I don't mean multiple couples. I mean a romance grouping that is more than two people. I am not going to try to disclude those types of stories from my discussion today, but I may throw out the words pair or couple when I'm speaking generally, and I don't 
mean to say that you can't have a menage series. Marie Carnet has a menage series and it works very well. And Laurel K. Hamilton writes uh, what I would consider the non-traditional romances where it's the same, usually the same woman for her, with multiple pairings and moresomes throughout the course of the series. So obviously it can be done. I'm not going to say that you can't, but I, I may fall into generalities of couple because there are far more examples where it's just two people in this field than there are with Minaj and more. So I'm not excluding Minaj or large groups or polyamory. I'm all for that. I intend to write a story like that at some point, but when I'm discussing this today, I will probably use the words couple and pair. So please don't be offended. All right, digging into the topic now. I'll start with the traditional series, the ones that are more typical of what you would get when you think romance series. The first series uh, we'll be talking about is the Travis's series by Lisa Kleypas. And the reason I want to talk about this one first is not so much that it's contemporary, but that it follows a very typical romance series model, which is to have a bunch of books set about characters in the same family. The sibling or family saga is a very common trope in romance series where each book follows a different sibling in a large family. You can have similar stories based around things like a group of friends from high school or college or co-workers that all work at the same place. People like military romance stories where it's all from the same squad or um, everybody who all works at a firehouse and it's, you know, firemen romances. So it doesn't really matter here what the common thread is that pulls everyone together, but whatever your reason is, it's a group of stories about people whose lives are linked in some way, but each of your stories follows a different protagonist and his or her love interest. And this is a very, very common model. I'm using it myself. So a good place to start is with an exemplary of this type, and the Travis series is perfect. It follows the siblings in the Travis family, hence the title, the Travis's series. And there are four Travis siblings, Gage, Jack, Haven, and Joe. And of course, each book is about one of those siblings. However, Kleypas does do something different with this series than I have seen in other places, which is that she writes all of the books in the series in first person from the perspective of the heroine. And if you're paying attention to the names I just said, there are three Travis brothers and only one Travis sister. So only one of the books is written from the perspective of one of the Travis siblings, and the other three books are from the perspective of the Travis men love interests. So that's something that's a little different and it's a way that she uses to uh, to freshen up the trope of the siblings. In fact, the first book uh, about Gage is not actually about Gage until about halfway through the book, which is unusual and different, but really works. I didn't think it was going to work, but it did. It did work for me. Um, they say that romance readers imprint on the first man that's introduced in the story. And that sort of did happen, but I understood when it came time for the the romance to come to fruition why, you know, the, the heroine did not pick Hardy, who is uh, her childhood uh, love interest. So it, it worked really well. She did some unexpected and different things. So just because this is a very common trope doesn't mean you can't mix it up and do unexpected things and do really fun things with a common trope. And uh, that's one of the things that people say a lot about romance is all oh, the tropes. But you know what? They're great. And it, I, for one, am a sucker for a couple of different tropes. Like I love the brother's best friend or the best friend's brother, whichever way you want to run that 
I'm, I'm a sucker for that story. I'll read even really terrible <laughs> books that have that trope. But I also really enjoy it when that trope is in play and then it gets mixed up somehow. So nothing wrong with tropes. And I'm, well, there can be things wrong with tropes. But tropes themselves aren't what's wrong. It's bad writing that then uses those tropes. So, but I digress. So the Travis series, other than some of the fun things that she does, is all otherwise a typical example of a family saga. So each of the books is only loosely connected to the other books by characters and setting. And each of the protagonists has their own individual plots and stories and baggage and they don't really overlap very much. So while the characters recur from story to story, like by the end of the fourth book, we're getting glimpses of what happily ever after looks like for earlier characters. They don't really have much to do with the plot of the fourth book. So that's the pretty quintessential romance series model. The connections, like I said, don't have to be family, but it often is. And there's no real overarching series conflict or, or plot. Each book stands all on its own, more or less. And you could kind of pick up any book in the series, and you wouldn't feel like you'd missed much, except for a couple, you know, throwaway references to these other characters who are happily in love. And you can think, well, they probably already had a story. And me being uh, a series completionist, I would then have to put down the book and go find the first one and start there. But for most people who aren't me, you could happily read the story and have no problems. But then there's other stories, other series, that follow a little bit more of an interconnected model. And that's where the Maiden Lane series comes into this discussion. The Maiden Lane series, as I mentioned earlier, is by Elizabeth Hoyt, and it's set in the Georgian period, so it makes it already a little different than other historical romances. But the reason I picked this series over many, many other historical romance series I could have talked about is because there is an element that connects these books in a not only a setting way or family relationships, but in a plot way, which is the character of the ghost of St. Giles. I am not going to spoil the series, but I will just say the ghost of St. Giles is very important throughout the series and the plot elements of each book somehow relate back to St. Giles or the family of the make pieces in pretty much all the books. So it's not just about here's a character and here's their story, but there are actual plot elements that if you haven't read earlier books in the series would not make sense to you if you read later books in the series. I mean, Hoyt does a really good job of catching you up and uh, giving you the pieces of backstory that you need to read each book if you were to try to read it as, as a standalone. But this is one series where I would say that it definitely pays to start at the beginning and go through to the end. And the end is coming soon, which makes me sad. The uh, last book in the series will be out next week. It's called The, the Duke of Desire, and I am both looking forward to it and very sad that it, it is here, even though there are two more novellas after this, so that's happy. But um, once it's done, you know, I'll be able to sit down and read the whole thing from beginning to end, and it will be lovely. And I highly recommend that you do so if you like historical romance series. But, so this is a, a different type of series. Yes, it's a family saga. Like I mentioned, um, most of the stories, the characters are either members of or somehow related to the Makepeace family who run the Foundling Home on Maiden Lane in St. Giles, which is where the series gets the title Maiden Lane. But there are lots of other things that overlap and connect. Another example of a more deeply connected series is Eloisa James's Desperate Duchesses series. It's a shorter series and it's pretty much already done. Um, so it doesn't overlap as much once you get into the later books. But within the first five books, there's one character, um, or I should say one romance. The threads are really woven into the stories of all of the first three books or first four books until it pays off in book five. The 
uh, heroine of book five has point of view passages in the first several books, which is very unusual. Sometimes you get like a little tiny piece of heroines that are going to be used in later books, depending on the author and their writing style. But James really puts her one character in there uh, a lot <laughs> in the earlier books and until it, her romance finally pays off later. So that's uh, another example where there are different ways to connect the stories rather than them just all being friends, living at the same place at the same time. You can actually weave the stories together. A Another one that does this that I have only read one book of, <laughs> but I read a book way down in later in the series, is the Suzanne Brockman's Trouble, wait, Troublemakers? Troubleshooters. I, uh, I should have done researched this first, but I just thought of it as I'm talking. Uh, but Suzanne Brockman's uh, series. And I had to read one of the books in that series for a class I took during grad school for my MFA in writing popular fiction. And there just were too many books in the series for me to catch up as I would normally have done. But I have to say that there was a lot of stuff that happened in that book that I did not understand because I had not read earlier books. And there were things that were obviously there that would not pay off for the next until the next book or maybe even the next several books. So she had a lot of threads going in that series. If you want another one that's kind of overlapping and deeply connected, the, the Trouble... Troublemakers? Troubleshooters. Eh. Suzanne Brockman's series is another good one for that. And in contrast to that deeply connected or even familiarly collect connected story series is Jennifer Ashley Shifter's Unbound series. In this series, the only thing that really connects most of the books is that it all takes place in the same world, the same paranormal world. Sometimes the characters know each other, often they don't, but it's all in this world where shifters are real and there's some senses of magic and otherworldly things and a lot of uh, other stuff going on. But you could pick up one book in that series and read it, whether it's book one or book nine, and you wouldn't feel particularly lost. She does a really good job of cluing you in to the world in each book because she doesn't really have to do much with characters and backstory from earlier books. All she needs to do is bring you into the world. So that's another way to do it, is these separate stories that all take place in one world, and it's still technically a series. To sum up, for a traditional romance series, the connection can be as loose as a shared world, or as interwoven as family, friends, plot lines of Maiden Lane, or you could go so far as to weave the threads of multiple stories into each book until those particular romances come to fruition. What makes the non-traditional romances different is that they never quite get to happily ever after, at least not till the end of the series. The stories follow a single couple over the course of a number of books, and while each book usually ends at a happy for now state, we don't get to leave them to their ever after until the end of the series. When I was looking for series to use for this episode, nearly all the ones I found that fit the one-couple profile were genre mashups, sometimes leaning more toward their other genre, mystery, fantasy, etc., but with a strong romance element. And it's no surprise that a very high percentage of the ones I found could be more accurately described as having a single protagonist, sometimes even being written in the first person, with his or her love interests along for the ride. They're almost all somewhere on the mystery thriller spectrum as well, with the exception of a few fantasy romances. I won't be talking about any of the fantasy romances in detail, primarily because they definitely skew more fantasy that happens to have a romance in it. But I do mention some at the end of the podcast if you're interested in reading those. And they tend to follow the, the Tolkien model which is, if you don't know the history of how The Lord of the Rings got published, is that there was a paper shortage and paper was expensive. <laughs> so they made him break up The Lord of the Rings into the three books. It was never intended to be a trilogy. And so 
when I think of fantasy series now, that's usually what I think of. It's one giant epic story that happens to be parceled out to us in the form of smaller chunks of books rather than one giant omnibus. Like I'm trying to imagine what would happen if they tried to print the entire Wheel of Time series into one book and it would be enormous, like OED enormous. OED, by the way, is the Oxford English Dictionary. You can't get it in a, not the actual full thing in a single volume, but you can get them in a couple of volumes and they're printed on like paper, tissue paper thin uh, pages and you have to, it actually comes with a magnifying glass because you can't read it otherwise. So that's kind of what they'd have to do with the Wheel of Time series if they tried to print that in even something close to a single volume. But I digress. In addition to the mystery model and the fantasy model, there is also somewhat difficult to classify series, including Outlander. And I included Outlander here, for one, because I'm a big fan, and also because I am striving against Diana Gabaldon trying to claim that it is not a romance when it so is a romance. But I'll talk about that later. Alright, so why is it that romance series with a single couple or almost always single protagonist and their love interest interests is so hard to do as a straight romance and has to be mashed up with other genres? Well, one of the reasons that I don't think a straight romance would work with this model is because a romance novel is about the couple getting together. Yes, there are many subgenres of romance that include mystery and suspense and fantasy and everything else. But if your book is romance first, then your plot arc in your book is going to be about the romance. Your story beats will match up to the arc of the romance. And when that's done, your story is done. You've arced and you're finished. And in order to make the story continue after that, you have to either put your characters on a new arc or you have to break the first arc and start over. And the few times I've seen authors try to do that, break the arc and start over, it does not end well. Uh, as I was researching this topic and looking for romance series with a single uh, romance in them, I found a couple of discussion boards on Goodreads where readers were talking about this kind of series. And one example, which I will not name the author or the series, but if you've read it, you'll know, is the author actually kills off the hero <laughs> at the beginning of the next book and sets up a new romance for her heroine. And that did not go over well with her fans at all. <laughs> so that's an example of how not to do this sort of story. <laughs> don't kill off your hero. Just, just don't. Another thing to not to do is find reasons for your couple to break up at the, usually at the end of each book, which is just terrible because you're supposed to at least end it happy for now. Um, or sometimes at the beginning of the next book. So everything's great and everything ends happily. And then in book two, they break up in the first scene. And that just feels shoddy to me as a reader. As you did all this work to get them to a place where they're together and happy. And now it's just all falling apart immediately when I pick up the next book. And you expect me to then go with you as they put themselves back together again. Caveat here is y you probably could do that if the threads for why they break up in the beginning of the second book were very well woven through the first book. I'm sure that there is someone who is skillful and talented enough to do that. But I don't think I am. I wouldn't attempt it, at least not at this point in my career and my writing ability. And I think it would be very, very difficult to pull off satisfactorily for me as a reader. So it is possible to have a series where in each book, there is a conflict between your couple. And 
for them to fight and to have problems and maybe even break up for a little bit for very, you know, well-written character reasons. And I'm okay with that. It's when you feel like you need to do that every time and you stop having character reasons because you've solved all of their, you know, their deep problems or their deep problems are getting to the point where I'm like, they're never going to stay together. So why am I reading this book anymore? Or why am I reading the series anymore? So it's really hard to keep that up over the course of a long series. It, it'll work okay for the first couple of books, but after a while it starts to get old or it starts to feel fake because you have to keep upping the stakes for reasons why they're not together anymore. So I want to start off by talking about an example of one that I think works the best. Because all relationships, of course, have bumpy spots, and I'm not opposed to quarreling or character-motivated misunderstandings or watching a relationship slowly unfurl over the course of a few books and then coming to a deep connection that then stays for the rest of the series. So that's an example of what I really like to see is that you let the characters be together and solve problems as a unit and that's why I'm going to talk about the In-Death series first, because it is an example of, I think, one of the best long-running romance series with the same characters that exists. And, uh, you know, obviously, Nora Roberts knows what she's doing. <laughs> she's the most uh, successful romance writer of all time. And she handles Eve and Rourke beautifully. It takes them several books to really learn to trust each other and then to make their permanent commitment in getting married. But once that's done, Roberts allows them to be together. Yes, they still have problems inside and outside of their relationship. But I never once doubted in any of the books that I have read, and I've read most but not all of them, that they will find their way through any issue that comes up together. So, like I said, I haven't read the first couple or the last couple of books. So, I mean, she could have done something really crazy in the last few books, and someone's probably going to respond to this and say, well, you know. But as of the point where I stopped reading, they were together and strong, and I never thought that she was going to end the book with them broken up, or even that they would actually break up throughout the course of the book. They're, they're going to be together. They're going to work it through. They trust each other. They love each other. And they're going to solve their problems by being together. And I really appreciate that about the series and about what Roberts does with it. There's no false conflict. There's no dragging back and forth, breaking up, getting back together. They're just, they work together. And that's wonderful. And you don't need to have your characters break up every book in order to create conflict. So if you want an example for how to do this, in Death series. The genre that's mashed with In Death is mystery with a little bit of sci fi because it's set in the future. And the mystery is obviously the thing that really drives the conflict in this series. The romance is a more important part in the earlier books. And then, like I said, she lets them just be together and she doesn't make the romance drive the conflict of later books. And that's another example of why pure romance, and when I say pure here, I, I just mean without another genre mixed in, is it, it just doesn't work for a long-running series because if you have to have the romance generating your conflict, it, it's going to all fall apart at some point. So, great, she uses the mystery to do the conflict instead, and that's wonderful. And the next series I want to talk about is the Wyborn and Griffin series by Jordan L. Hawk. Now, I've only read the first two books of the series, and I'm getting ready to pick up the third one. But from what I've seen so far, she's doing an excellent job of creating a romantic pairing that will continue to develop and grow over the course of the series. In the second book, there were some misunderstandings and a fight, but everything was very well motivated based on known character flaws and their baggage. And since it's only the second book in the series, it makes sense that these two people are getting to know each other, learning to trust in their love, and stumbling a little bit along the way. Now, if that's something that continues over the course of the series, and they stumble and break apart often, 
I will probably fall off of these books as quickly as I have fallen into them. But I have high hopes. I have high hopes that as they, as, as Griffin and Wyborn go it, more deeply into their relationship and their love for each other and learn to trust that it will end up being a, a lovely series that I, I'm just going to adore. And really, they're they're just such a lovely couple. This is an, an odd one, too, because um, it's written in first person from the perspective of Wyborn. And I was really not expecting that when I picked these up. I, I thought it was going to be the, the more normal third person dual protagonists. And the fact that it's written in first person is, is a little bit refreshing and different. So I'm, I'm excited to see what happens next. And I can't read to, uh, wait to read the third book. So the next series that I want to talk about is the Outlander series. And I included this in this discussion because it is huge and sprawling. And I want to talk about how romance can work even in a series of this type where you've got a whole lot of stuff going on outside of your characters. But the one romance in particular, is the heart of the series. And yeah, don't let Diana Gabaldon's protestations fool you. Outlander is a romance. The first book, Outlander, is absolutely a romance. <laughs> she doesn't follow all of the so-called rules of romance, and she deliberately sets out to foil or invert some tropes, but it's still a romance. <laughs> It works. If you look at the romance arc and you look at romance beats, they're all in there. It's a romance. <laughs> and Dragonfly and Amber and Voyager, which is books two and three, take us through one big arc of separation and finally reconnection between Jamie and Claire. And then after that, it stops being such a, a traditional romance as far as plot, but the heart of the series is always Jamie and Claire. And yes, we start getting other romances with, you know, the other characters coming together and forming uh, pairings and sometimes moorings. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the thing that brings people back to the Outlander series is Jamie and Claire and the strength of their relationship. Even when they're separated geographically or chronologically, you know, hundreds of years apart, they, their love centers and grounds the series. That could be, you know, a, a very difficult series to get into without that romance at the heart of it. Because Gabaldon writes beautifully, but she writes in chunks, and it's very little, little episodic things, and her the plots of her books aren't very straightforward. So, if you didn't have something bringing you back and pulling you through, it might be difficult to read those. But Jamie and Claire bring us through it. And another thing about Gabaldon is that, honestly, she's a bit of a snob. In her earlier part of her career, she was a little bit more interested in belonging to the romance community and she even said one of the things that I like to quote about romance novels she said and I quote harlequin romances have very strict guidelines as to length and content so do sonnets and villanelles neither length nor guidelines have anything to do with the quality of writing or story end quote so at some point in her career she was willing to talk about how formula and content and and guidelines and and length aren't what makes a story great or bad it's the writing and she has since kind of broken away from that and it's every single time you hear her talk she says outlander's not a romance and i don't understand why she feels the need to to break away from the genre that supported her in the beginning, but I'm getting off topic. So getting back to series. Um, one of the things that all three of these series do is that they don't break the romance contract. Even Outlander does not break the romance reader contract. So what is that? If you don't already know, the romance reader contract 
is the same as a mystery reader contract, right? A mystery is going to be solved. Even if they don't get their man at the end, or woman, as the case may be, they're going to figure out who done it. And if they don't, then you're going to feel dissatisfied with that mystery. The romance reader contract is, there's going to be a happy ending. There are some other expectations in there, too, that can be toyed with and bent, but that's the one that cannot be broken. There has to be a happy ending, whether ever after or happy for now. So no killing off the love of someone's life, and no breaking up the couple at the end of the book. And for these bigger series uh, that are mashed up with other genres, you might feel like saying, well, you know, it's not really a romance series. It's a mystery series. It shouldn't have to follow the rules of romance. And okay, that's true if it's really just a mystery series. But for one thing, killing off a character's love interest which is almost always killing off the hero's girlfriend or wife is a very overused and cliche trope that needs to go away forever. And for another, it's one thing to have your characters be in relationships with other people. Obviously you're going to write characters who have relationships, whether it's friendships or lovers, girlfriends, wives, husbands, boyfriends, whatever people have relationships The existence of a relationship in your book is normal and fine. And that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is when you actually write a romance plot into your book. So, if you are going to take the time to have two characters meet and fall in love, you are signaling to your reader that you are going to respect the romance rule. And yes, there are lots of literary fiction stories out there that have romances in them where someone dies or they don't get together and, you know, it's a tragedy instead of a romance. I'm not even really talking about that here because you sort of know that you're getting that story when you pick it up because you didn't find it in the genre fiction section. You found it in the literature section. Different genre, different expectations. Over here in the genre world, if a romance is in the story, I am going to expect it to have a happy ending. And maybe that's my personal expectation, but I don't think I'm alone. If you disagree with me, please feel free to get in touch and we can talk about it. I'm, I'm open to other people's ideas. But for myself, if I go through the, the trials and the wonder of falling in love with these characters... I want them to be happy at the end of it. Or at least for there to be some really good reason why they're not. Like, really, really good. You you have to... I don't know. You have to do your work there. Because I love romance. <laughs> and so breaking the romance reader contract is going to make me step back a little bit as a reader. And that's what happens in the very last series I'm going to talk about, which is Janet Ivanovich's Stephanie Plum series. I know, I know. I hear you all saying, well, that's cozy mystery. It's not a romance. Yes, it is cozy mystery, but it is also a romance. Janet Ivanovich started her career writing category romance. And at one point early in the Plum days, she said she knew who Stephanie would end up with and that she wouldn't drag it out forever. <laughs> 24 books later, she's still beating the love triangle to death. And after just going on the internet and looking up what's happening in book 24, it seems she's now brought Diesel, a character that used to only appear in the Between the Numbers novellas, and who, by the way, has his own series and his own love interest in that series. She's brought him into the main books to, I assume, muddy the waters of Plum's romance life even further. Uh, To be honest, I mean, I really don't know for sure. I just said I had to research it. I stopped reading after book 17. That's how turned off I was by the constant back and forth and the feeling that everything in Stephanie's life is reset sitcom style after every book. What do I mean by sitcom style reset? 
If you've listened to the second episode of The Feminist Romantic, my brother and I talked about the will they or won't they trope, and I talked a little bit in there about the sitcom reset. Basically, in the broadcast-only days of television, it was very common for television shows to reset to a certain status quo at the end of each episode. Audiences came back each week to get the same feeling they'd gotten the week before, whether that was amusement and hilarity from a sitcom or suspense and justice from a murder mystery show. The exception to episodic shows are day and nighttime dramas or soaps, where the ever-developing story is the part that brings the viewers back. But viewers and readers are getting more sophisticated, and we like our characters to grow even on a sitcom. So by the 90s and early 2000s, sitcoms had started to introduce longer-running plot elements that actually changed the status quo of the show. Think of Monica and Chandler getting married on Friends. Other shows, like Seinfeld, stuck doggedly to their show-about-nothing format. But in the streaming and binge-watching era, Seinfeld doesn't hold up. I can watch an episode or two, and aside from cringing at some of their tasteless jokes, I I laugh at other ones, and it's not a terrible experience. But after about two episodes, I get bored. Everything is the same. And that's how I feel about the Plum books. Nothing ever changes in Plum's Trenton. And Ivanovich has to keep coming up with more and more complicated reasons and rationales for the romance plot not to come to fruition because that would change the status quo. And I'm bored. Sure, they're still funny, but funny isn't enough to keep me coming back. I know if I go and pick up book 24 tomorrow, even though I haven't read any of the last seven books, I won't feel like I missed anything. My current plan is the way for her to just be done. And then maybe I'll read the last book in the series. Or maybe I'll just go to Wikipedia and read the synopsis that someone puts up there to find out who Stephanie finally ends up with. So that's an example of how not to do it, because she breaks the romance reader contract. She continues to not let any of her romances, whichever one, come to the point of happy ever after. And it stops being interesting and starts being boring after a while. From my research, uh, I found another series that people had noted that they thought was a example of how not to do these. And that's the Ashling Gray series by Katie Matt Callister. Now I haven't read them, so I don't know, but what was said was that um, it's a lot of false conflict and breaking characters up. Um, it, the end of the books. I think they said the end of the books, which is a real big no-no, at least break them up at the beginning of the next book. But basically, you know, there was some reason why the characters can't get happy ever after every time. So that's another one that wasn't done well, but some that I have seen recommended as being very good are Patricia Briggs's Alpha and Omega and Mercy Thompson series. And Mercy Thompson was mentioned several times as being well done. So um, that's been on my TBR pile for a really long time, and I should probably start reading it. <laughs> but I'll get to it eventually. Another one is Il- Alona Andrews with the Kate Daniel series. And I just read recently that the last book in the series is coming up soon. So as soon as that's out, I'll probably sit and I'll binge the entire series from start to finish. Another one is Mary Janice Davison's Undead series and um, Amanda Boucher's Kingmaker Chronicles, which are still in process and are on my TBR pile. So I haven't read those yet either, but I definitely want to read those. And one thing to note about all of these is that they are paranormal romance, urban fantasy, or in the case of the Kingmaker Chronicles, straight fantasy romance. And they use those mystery fantastic elements to carry the series forward. Just like with uh, Jordan L. Hawks and with In Death and Outlander using sci-fi, fantasy, historical, etc. elements to carry it. So they all have this in common, that they're all genre mashups. I didn't find a single romance series that was straight 
romance that followed the same couple, except for the one I mentioned where the author killed off the hero in the next, and I'm not even going to talk about that one. Um, I didn't find any like that, that didn't have some element of another genre brought in to help carry the plot. If you know of any, please let me know, because I'd love to chat about it and read it and see how it works. So there seems to be something here about the way a romance works that doesn't work for series in the same way that, say, mystery or fantasy works in a series. And it's not that it can't be done. It's that you have to look at the romance a little differently if you want to write that kind of series. One of the reasons I decided to talk about this topic is because I recently got a review of my first book, Essential Magic, from a reader who thought he was getting that sort of fantasy series set up where it's one big story broken into small book-sized chunks. And that's not what the Fae of Sky series is. The Fae of Sky series follows the romance standard model of each book focusing on a different couple. Now, yes, I, I do bring in a lot of fantasy elements. There is an overarching series conflict and plot that follows through. So it, it makes sense to read my books in order. In theory, I try to clue you in to all the pieces of the puzzle you need in later books that if you picked up book three, you'd, it would make sense. But really, you should start with book one, and that's the way it will make the most sense to you. So for him, I didn't meet his expectations because he thought he was getting something that he did not end up getting. So I've, I've added some, some sentences to my blurb, and hopefully I, I am managing my reader expectations a little more. But it really got me thinking about the difference between a romance series and a series in just about any other genre. And that's what spurred this topic, and uh, I, I think it's kind of interesting. And um, I I've, think I want to try in my next series to follow a single couple through uh, a series of adventures and just to find out what happens. I have an idea for an epic fantasy series, and it actually wouldn't be a couple. It would be a menage. It would be a, an MMF pair or grouping. And uh, so maybe, maybe I'll, I'll be writing about that next. I got to finish book four in my Fairy of Sky series, though. <laughs> Once that's done, I can start thinking about other series. But it's something to consider. And uh, if you write series, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts of how you handle romance in your series. Whether you are a romance author and you write you know, the, the more family saga-ish type, or whether you're a mystery author who puts romance in your books, and so you follow the same protagonist and their love interests over the series of several books. Get in touch and let me know what you think. If you have other series that you think I should read uh, to broaden my knowledge on this topic, get in touch and let me know. My email is thefeministromantic at gmail.com, or you can comment on my blog at thefeministromantic.com. My next episode will be right before Halloween, so expect a spooky special. I'll be talking about stories that cross the unlikely line between romance and horror. I have a few in mind, but if you have some suggestions, let me know. Until next time, I'm Kara McKinnon, and thanks for listening. <laughs>